My name is Peggy Chang. I'm one of the uh, academic advising deans in the office of the dean of the college. And I work with Meg Mori and Alexis Rodriguez Camacho at the Curricular Resource Center. So great to see you all here today. Um, Theories in Action is actually in its eighth year, not seventh year, as uh, I mistakenly put in the official announcement. Um, so we have 65 students participating this year, and they join over 500 seniors who have participated in this symposium um, during its uh, eight year uh, history. Um, Theories in Action is an opportunity for students to be in conversation with one another and with you. Um, you'll notice that we're calling these sessions roundtables, not panel discussions. So we hope that um, they will be able to generate a conversation with you. Um, it's an opportunity, Theories in Action is also a unique opportunity for students to be together in a cross-disciplinary diverse space. It's a chance for them to reflect publicly on the social significance of their academic extracurricular or community-based projects and commitments. Um, there's a paper schedule of events that you'll see near the doorway. Um, you can also visit the schedule at browntia.org. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to the session facilitator. Nirva La Fortune just joined the office of the Dean of the College as an academic advisor and program manager for the new Presidential Scholars Program. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here and to be able to um, participate and also um, hear all of these wonderful students' um, research. And so the roundtable um, discussion topic is reimagining power in education. And so our presenters are Anne Fosberg. Um, whose research is toward a radical university critical pedagogy in higher education. Bruna Lee, teaching and learning for social justice at Breakthrough. Katia Barrett, a case study on immigrate, uh, immigrant adolescents in the French public school system. Sarah Eve Dill, migrant schools, social networks, and strategies for a simulation in China's new urbanization and also Yuval Yousefi in pursuit of holistic academics, feminist econom um, econom uh, economists <laughs> critiques of objectivity. And so our first presenter will be Anne Fosberg. Eve, okay. We're in the order. Okay. Um, Sarah Eve Dill. Okay, so our first presenter will be Sarah Eve Dill. I apologize for that. Um, Sarah Eve Dill is a graduating senior in development studies. Her research focuses on rural to urban migrants and the effects of urbanization on legal and social categories. This presentation is a product of 15 months living and teaching at a school for migrant youth in Beijing, China. My name is Eve, um, and before I begin my uh, presentation, I just want to um, kind of introduce our panel. And we uh, got together and we kind of came up with a quest with some guiding questions that we want to use to structure this presentation and discussion with you guys. So um, throughout our presentations, we ask you to reflect on your past and current educational communities and experiences. Where do you see power, and how can you imagine it allocated differently? Um, and you can keep that in mind throughout our presentations. So my presentation is Migrant Schools, Social Networks, and Strategies for Assimilation in China's New Urbanization. But um, really what this title doesn't say is that my, my research, my thesis in this presentation is actually focused a lot on space. So to begin, I'd like to uh, start with a discussion on one specific space. This is Dandelion Middle School. It's a middle school for students in grades seven to nine. Um, it's on the outskirts of Beijing, in southern Beijing, um, Dashing District specifically. Um, and although it's a part of Beijing, it's not exactly a part of Beijing. Dandelion Middle School was formerly a light switch factory, and now it serves migrant students um, who are not legally allowed to attend public schools in Beijing. 
And as an institution set up specifically for migrant students who are seen as outsiders, it also reinforces their social segregation from the city. Um, and I saw that in particular in some of the ways that teachers and administrators um, interacted with students. For example, I saw one teacher tell a group of new students, you are not a part of Beijing. And that made me wonder, what does it mean to really be a part of Beijing then? Um, so this research is based on 15, uh, 15 months of ethnographic fieldwork and interviews um, at Dandelion Middle School. And I explore space, social networks, and how space structures social networks, and also how space structures migrant families' strategies for social mobility. Um, and my research is trying to present these strategies as migrant families see them um, and as they interpret policy and policy changes. Um, so to begin, I want to talk about why migrant workers even have these spatial issues in urban China. And that really gets to the rural-urban divide, which in China is organized by the state and legal policies. So we have this household registration system, also known as the Hukou system, and that divides people into urban and rural. Urban people have formal employment. Um, formerly, it was guaranteed for life, formal employment. And with that comes formal housing and a lot of social services, um, education, health care, et cetera. Rural people, on the other hand, have land rights. And they mainly engage in subsistence farming. Their land is their livelihood. And their land is also their social safety net um, in the way that employment and housing are urban people's social safety net. Now, urban people and rural people both have access to social services like schools and hospitals, but they only have access to those in their hometowns, in their local spaces. And also because rural people generally live more spread out and um, there, there are fewer people, there are also fewer and worse quality services. Um, so that's something definitely to consider. Um, and there have been two ways of looking at migrants in China um, and around the world. First, um, mobility. As among migrants has been seen as a form of marginalization. So migrants are outsiders, they're not a part of the formal economy, and they're not a part of formal society, and their, their mobility kind of marks them as having this marginal status. And we see this also in like the United States, too, in the case of undocumented immigration, where we see like undocumented people as transient as, and as like not deserving of social services the way that citizens who are localized in the space are viewed. Um, but there's another way to view migrants, which is as um, structuring their mobility in a way to maximize the benefits to themselves and their families. So for example, migrants who have land rights in their hometowns may have some people stay at home and engage in farm labor while they go and work for wage labor in the informal economy. And this is a way for them to maximize their household income. And it's actually like a really beneficial strategy for many migrants. And it's not considered in a lot of immigration policy or migration policies in China or in other countries um, where this also happens. Um, but at the same time, urbanization is happening and it's changing people's lives kind of whether they want to or not. Um, and rural people are being forced to become urban whether they want to or not. So this is a picture of Beijing and we can see that there are like six rings um, and generally, the um, formal employment, most of the mainstream economy goes in, on inside within the uh, first four rings. Outside of that is uh, mostly informal migrant communities and farmland and stuff like that. But this area is urbanizing quickly, and China has recently come up with a major plan to integrate Beijing, a city nearby, and the surrounding province, which is mainly rural, into one large urban area. And that also involves um, like connecting a circumference of about a thousand kilometers um, through like railroads and subway networks and stuff like that, um, and there and this is um, creating this peri-urban area where rural areas are quickly giving way to urban expansion, and this has two effects. First, rural people are being displaced; they're losing their land to make way for urban expansion, and they're not necessarily being given the urban entitlements that come with um, growing urban space like formal employment and formal housing. Second, we see new pathways are opening to, for rural people like migrants and like displaced people to assimilate into urban environments. However, these pathways are really complicated and circuitous. Um, and we see more and more that formal employment is replacing citizenship as a basis for entitlements, as a basis for social services. So it's not necessarily that you're an urban resident anymore. It's about being employed in urban areas. Um, so this is 
a, a list of occupations of families at Dandelion School. And we see from this list that families have a huge variety of outcomes economically within Beijing. There are like entrepreneurs, they invest in businesses, they start their own restaurants, they work with each other, they're employed by each other. But at the same time, they're all part of the informal economy. And this really structures adult migrants' experiences and ideas about their, their children's future and their own future. Because they're all informal, a lot of their business is really precarious. Um, they face a lot of limitations by the government on what kind of work they can engage in. They find that their um, spaces are continually being encroached on with urban expansion and demolition and stuff like that. And they also point to their own lack of education and their own understanding of themselves as rural people as um, ways that they're marginalized within the city. And kind of in relation to that, um, this is a picture of a migrant community, by the way, and businesses and stuff. And you can kind of see that informal and formal uh, juxtaposition within the picture. But um, so because migrants see their lives as so informal, um, within Beijing, their goal for their children is really to become formal, to become part of the formal economy and formal society. And they view that through um, employment. And the way to access employment for many of these families is education. And with the growth of the peri-urban area, we see that there are new spaces that are allowing people to engage in new pathways through education to get to formal employment. And um, this kind of explains the two pathways in both cases, we see that families come from their rural hometowns to peri-urban areas like migrant communities in Beijing or in surrounding Hebei, and they start businesses, they start homes, and they send their kids to school. But when it comes to high school, uh, based on the legal requirements they, that they have to face and all of the different things that they have to navigate, we see that some people choose to send their kids back home while they keep working in the cities, while others send their kids to new high schools that are just beginning to allow migrant students to enter them. And this is where places like migrant uh, schools in Beijing, like Dandelion Middle School, take on a great amount of significance. Because these schools are mediating migrant students' either integration into these new um, urban and urbanizing environments, or their returns to rural life and possibly eventually into migrant labor. Because the bar from, to jump from rural to urban is much, much higher. So how do families decide which pathway to pursue? Um, well, that depends on social networks, and in particular, the relationship between space and social networks. So um, I really like this picture. Um, this picture is of uh, students at Dandelion Middle School, and it has arrows connecting them back to their hometowns. <laughs> and this really shows the social nature of space and social relations. I mean, a lot of these students have family members. Oh, sorry, I'll wrap it up. A lot of these students have family members who are still in their hometowns, and they have uh, their families have uh, some land holdings, perhaps. They have connections that are both social and spatial. Um, and that's a really important part of their decision making, these ties that they have. And we see people who don't have these ties don't look at their hometowns as an option to return to. They don't see that pathway as available. And they really struggle to find a, a pathway in the peri-urban area. Um, and migrants, in addition to their hometown connections, also have connections in these communities, these workplaces that they develop in Beijing. Migrants with stronger connections in this area are more likely to try and stay in Beijing and try to go to these peri-urban schools because the information that they're getting has more value when applied to this um, peri-urban space. Um, and this is, for adults, this is their enclave communities. And for youth, this is like the peer-to-peer -peer networks that they have at sites like their schools. Um, so in the case of Dandelion Middle School, we see a lot of students are socialized within this space to one another um, and they want to stay there. Um, in addition, migrants also have connections to locals and assimilates in Beijing, particularly through Dandelion Middle School, which is a formal institution, and it's one of the only sites where migrants are actually communicating with people who are formally employed in the mainstream economy of Beijing. And then finally, um, migrants have connections to locals and assimilates in peri-urban Hobantay. And this actually is closest, this form of connection is closest to the connections that migrants have to their hometowns. So this first relationship, migrants in their hometowns, and the last one, migrants and locals assimilate and assimilates in peri-urban Hebei, are most significant in structuring how they receive information, how they value it, and how they make strategies um, in relation to it. 
Um, and my main findings from this is basically that migrants with stronger social spatial ties to their hometowns choose to return home because they know more about this option and because they value the, spa the spatial opportunities of their rural social ties. Their rural networks provide detailed information pointing both to pathways and to examples of successful urban assimilation through returning to their hometowns. However, migrants with strong social spatial ties to their destination, which is to locals um, in Beijing and Hebei and to assimilates in Beijing and Hebei, as well as to other migrants in their communities in Beijing, they use their social ties and these resources to strategize instead for going to peri-urban pathways of assimilation, to attending peri-urban high school and hopefully college. Um, but because urbanization is ongoing and it's a really complex process with a lot of policy changes, um, migrants, strategies in the peri-urban area are really dependent on the quality and formation of the social ties that they have to this area. And in some cases, we see that migrants who have weak ties, maybe they only have ties to Dandelion School or they only have ties to one relative in this area, when policies change, this is when their strategies begin to fail. And that's where we really see the importance of social ties coming in and the spatial nature of these social ties and how they structure migrants' relationships to the places that they uh, occupy, live, and work in. Okay, thanks very much. So now we'll have about five minutes um, for Q&A, so if anyone has any questions about the research, um, we'll take about five minutes for that. How did you get interested in this topic? Oh, um, my Chinese teacher in high school actually worked at this school briefly and told me about it. Um, I was originally only planning to stay there for the summer, um, but they asked me to stay on as a volunteer teacher, and I was able to kind of get to know a lot of the students and their families that way. Who is your thesis advisor? Um, Elena Shi in Development Studies. Are, are you going to present, have you, or are you going to present the, your findings to like, the administration at the school or anybody related to Oh, this? yeah. That's actually a really good question. I am planning to, um, I'm hoping to send a copy of my thesis back to the school, but I'd also like to present my findings in a way that um, can help the school better structure how it provides information to students and their families so that they have information um, with enough time to make really informed decisions for their kids. And also kind of work with the school to um, help them, or maybe to influence them to see students as more active agents, because right now a lot of the social networks that form between like people at the school and migrant families are adult networks. And then when students are the primary decision makers, they actually lose out because they don't have access to these networks. Any ideas of how you want to make that more like stu talk to students? Oh, oh yeah. Um, so I think that um, there should be a lot more like information exchange going on between students and teachers in the classroom. A lot of students, like the, the teacher is kind of the center of the classroom in um, Chinese schools and the students just like listen or only respond when the teacher kind of actively tries to engage them. And so I think that teachers really need to open the space to kind of let students ask questions and have a dialogue with them about their opportunities and the choices that they should be making and where the information they're getting is coming from and how they should kind of interpret it and apply it. So do these um, schools first specifically for migrants, do they have like counseling services for like to plan students' futures or is it just like does it happen in the teaching environment in the classroom? Yeah, so um, most schools for migrants are really, really informal. And it's just like migrants who have an education set up a school, tell people like, oh, we'll take care of your kids and teach them math and, and reading if you give us some money. And in those kinds of institutions are really informal and they have no support system. And actually students who go to those schools like don't have any record of being educated, even if they become educated through them. Um, Dandelion School is a little different because it's a government accredited institution. So it's a formal school and that's also why these pathways are available to students and things. 
but most of the way that they like structure information giving is like parents have to come at a set time twice a year to like a <laughs> big parents meeting where they give them all of the information at once. And a lot of parents really struggle to even like go to these meetings because it's during their work day and other stuff like that. So um, the institution really structures and like heavily controls how it passes along information. And that makes it really hard for some people to access it. Um, and that's what holds a lot of people back, I think. Um, can you, I feel like I cheated a little bit because I heard the rest of this at DS, but um, can you talk about um, how some of the family relationships change um, when pa families pick the pathway that the student returns um, to their rural community? Um, if there's kind of power shifts in decision making processes or if kind of relationships between um, children and their parents change in any ways? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, yeah, when families split up like that, it definitely changes the social and emotional bonds that they have to each other. So um, a lot of the students that I talked to, for example, they um, were raised by their grandparents and they came to Beijing to be with their parents when they were much older. Um, and they definitely have a kind of more tense relationship and they're definitely more often the primary decision makers in their future. And I think the same happens a lot of the time when kids have to return home as well, especially because parents usually stay in Beijing to work when they return their kids home. And their kids are maybe 14 or 15 years old, and they kind of feel like, well, you're an adult now, and you should be making the decisions. Um, Unfortunately, a lot like a lot of the time, students who go back and have to be making these decisions for themselves, like they don't necessarily um, see college education as this like end all be all. You need it to move upward in the way that their parents see it, and a lot of them are more willing to just kind of go and get a job as soon as they can. And in those cases, they're more likely to find informal work and just kind of like become migrant laborers like their parents, rather than um, get a college diploma and try and find like a white collar job like their parents hope they will. Um, also, if you return to your rural hometown, like there's um, this college entrance exam, the Gaokao, and your score basically determines whether you get into college or not. And the um, minimum score requirement is way higher if you're from a rural area. So if you go back home, like, it's an, an easier option legally, but it's a much harder option academically. You have to pass like a much higher bar to even be accepted to school. And most families don't know that when they're making their decisions. Thank you. Thank you. So our next presenter will be Katya Barrett. So while she, she's walking, um, <laughs> Katia is from Port Washington, New York, and concentrates in education studies and comparative literature. She has spent most of her time at Brown thinking about learning and teaching in different contexts, including as a four-year Bright tutor and as a teaching assistant for a GED class at the Rhode Island ACI. Her research focuses on understanding youth as educational experts and on the gaps between policy and practice. Following graduation, Katia will teach English for a year in a high school in Strasbourg, France, before returning to Brown to pursue a Master's of Arts in teaching. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about my education studies thesis today, which is a case study on immigrant adolescents in the French public school system. Um, I began this project as an independent study while studying abroad in Lyon, France in fall of 2015. Um, and then was able to return to my research sites in August 2016, this past summer, to conduct follow-up interviews with the students and teachers that I had observed. So to give you a little context on my research and methodology, um, Lyon, France, which is in the middle on that map there, um, is a mid-sized city in France. Um, and I conducted research at two sites with the same group of 12 newly arrived immigrant adolescents. They're the students who comprise my case study. So at Collège Real Dufy, on the left, um, it's a middle school in a predominantly immigrant neighborhood. I observed these 12 students in class. And the way the French school system works for newly arrived immigrant teenagers on the middle and high school level is that they spend their first year in the system in a self-contained reception class um, focused on learning French and then are put into the mainstream school population. 
Um, so for the entire 2015-2016 school year, these 12 students were spending six hours of every eight hour day with one teacher in one classroom learning French. Um, and the 12 students were themselves incredibly diverse. They spoke 10 languages among the 12 of them. I also conducted research and interview at the Ados Community Center, which is pictured on the right here. Um, it's an organization that provides after school tutoring and activities for youth in this neighborhood. Um, and these two educational institutions go about their work with the same group of students in really different ways. So having these two research sites, as well as my two research phases, um, interviewing and doing observations both during the year itself and after it, allowed me to get to know these 12 students and their world more fully. Um, so in terms of my specific aims for this project and the reason I was interested in it, um, I was thinking a lot about how immigrant youth and immigrant boys and youth of color in particular are often portrayed in the French media and in the current French political discourse as freeloaders, delinquents, rioters, and more recently and troublingly as potential terrorists. And I wanted to counter this narrative um, by talking about how even when these youth are experiencing challenges in school, which many of the 12 students in the study were, um, and even when from time to time as middle schoolers are ought to do, they are being challenges for their school, they were also thinking really deeply and thoughtfully about their education and the experiences that they were having in school in the day to day. Um, so throughout my project, these youth, um, the 12 in general, and I focus in five, uh, on five different students in particular, are the educational experts. They're those people who can tell us how policy is being translated in the classroom, how curriculum is interpreted and felt, um, and how tests are received. So I want to focus on one student in particular who hopefully can reveal what can be gained from taking youth voice seriously um, and from explicitly including marginalized youth in conversations about educational systems and their functioning. Um, so in the fall of 2015, Ahmed, who is one of the students in that picture that I probably shouldn't tell you which for like privacy reasons, um, was 13 years old. He is of Algerian and Moroccan origin. Um, he was a new resident of Lyon, and it was the first time that he had been fully enrolled in the French school system. He spoke fluent Arabic, and he was also very proficient in French. Um, so he was able to use those linguistic skills to translate for his peers a lot of the time, as well as for his family. Um, and he was a leader in the class. Um, he was always one of the captains for after school soccer matches. He was also immensely clever and quick on his feet. Um, one anecdote about that um, is that because he spoke some French, the teacher often called on him to fill gaps in the conversation in the classroom or when no one else like, knew what to say or understood what she was asking. Um, and one day during a unit on food vocabulary, she uh, said, OK, Ahmed, get us started. Um, when you get home from school, what food do you ask your mom to make for you? And without missing a beat, he answered in Arabic, much to the like giggles of his classmates. Um, and when the teacher just looked like so confused, he said, without missing a beat, well, I don't speak to my mom in French, so why would I answer that question in French? <laughs> um, but despite all of these really incredible attributes um, and being a really just lovely 13-year-old boy, he was having a really hard time adjusting to the French school system. Um, he was frequently in trouble with different teachers and administrators. Towards the end of the winter um, in 2016, he was threatened with being held back. And his individual experience um, is really actually very reflective of broader trends of how North African immigrant boys in France in particular um, are disadvantaged within the school system. So to give you a sense of just some broad statistics, in 2015, a study found that 43% of North African immigrant males repeated a grade, um, as opposed to 17% of French-born males. And 28% of North African origin boys eventually drop out of school before the end of high school. So that's more than a quarter of that specific population. And I think it's pretty straightforward to see how that will have significant repercussions, both for that population in, in, um, in specific and for the health of French society as a whole. So both as a immigrant, newly arrived immigrant student in general and because of his particular identities, Ahmed is a student who it was clear that the French school system is not doing a very good job educating or incorporating. The school knew that, his teachers knew that, Ahmed knew that. Um, so I thought it only made sense to ask Ahmed what he thought that his school could be doing differently. And yet, in our first interview, <laughs> when I asked him how he felt about his school, 
he was bewildered. Um, and I cannot replicate his like mocking voice that just like knocked me down eight pegs. But he repeated my question and said, how do I feel about school in France? What does it matter? Um, and I want to make it clear that as hopefully my next slide will show, this response didn't come from the fact that Ahmed didn't have strong feelings about his education, um, but rather it's an indication of the fact that many marginalized youth, um, and I think youth who don't speak the language of a country fluently or have been told that the way they speak that language is invalid, internalize the belief um, that their voices are not invited or important in conversations about larger systems and their functioning, um, which is why I think that while I'm sure all of us agree that youth voice is important, it's important for me to make that explicit as a primary argument of this thesis. Which leads me to the first of the central findings of my thesis, which is that youth of all backgrounds and language abilities have the capacity to make essential contributions to conversations about educational systems and their functioning. Across the board, um, and despite kind of the dubious responses of many teachers who were questioning why I was choosing to interview certain students, whether or not the students in the study could properly conjugate their verbs or negate a sentence really had no bearing on the validity of their opinions about their school system. And then the next two findings are specific to the Ahmed section of my thesis. Um, so when he talked about French schools um, and how he felt about them on a day-to-day -day basis, Ahmed frequently talked about how he didn't feel like there was space for him. He observed how in the way that classes were structured and class rosters were assembled, in the way that after school programs were advertised, there seemed to be a clear dichotomy to him between French students and outsiders. And as a student who identified as Algerian, Moroccan, Muslim, and French, he was really unsure of where he was supposed to fit in that dichotomy. And as a result, and I think a pretty rational reaction, he often just chose to take himself out of the situation, either by acting out and causing teachers to remove him, or just by not attending after school programming and tutoring that he would have benefited from um, in general. So I think in those ways, it became clear that the French schools often reflect and thus perpetuate the broader societal divisions that they claim to want to combat. Um, we can see that although French schools claim integration as a central mission um, and have explicitly claimed this as a central mission going back to their founding in the 1880s, the experiences of students like Ahmed reveal that the current policies of the French public school system really only offer immigrant adolescents a very narrow one-way path of assimilation. Um, that is not well received sensibly um, or seems promising for students who hope to maintain plural identities. Um, so I hope that those two last findings, although they're negative about the current system specifically, show that when we talk to youth, um, particularly those who are experiencing challenges in their school about what could be doing better, they have remarkable capacity to highlight specific things that can indicate potential changes, right? These are things that Ahmed's teacher, Ahmed's school, and the school system in general um, could be taking concrete steps to address. So above all, I hope my project shows um, that despite the fact that youth like the 12 students who make up my study are often stereotyped and disregarded, they actually are educational experts, um, and that they demonstrate why, both in the French context in specific, um, but in, I think, all national contexts more broadly, that youth should be included in policy discussions um, as experts in this, about the schools that they attend. So now we'll take about five minutes for questions. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, well, actually, I have two questions, but let me start with the broader contextual question. So uh, when you think about integration policies in France, mm -hmm. um, so what the, I think, to be a caricature uh, of a kind of response here, I think um, if a French teacher or official was here, they would say that integration is the most successful mechanism for um, addressing potential societal conflicts that come when people act out their differences in the public sphere, right? So sort of different than the American concept. Um, and that their proof is, in a sense, prior success, that they point to other groups. And one of the most conser socially conservative things you'd hear these days, from, or even reactionary things you'd hear from the far right, is it's specifically Muslims who are failing to integrate, but others in the past have done so. So I guess I'm wondering how you would respond to Le Pen and, and mm -hmm. that side of the political spectrum in light of your findings uh, around cultural specificity. It's 
a big task. Uh, but I think one thing that my that the students um, in this study spoke to um, in pushing back against the idea that other groups have successfully integrated into France in the past, and thus you should be able to also, according to this model, um, is that the French model of um, promoting difference blindness um, runs into a barrier when students are different in ways that are never going to disappear, um, be that the color of their skin or visible um, religious manifestations. Um, so I think uh, one of the other quotes in my, in my thesis um, by Ahmed talks about how um, his school is going to tell him that he's not an immigrant the next year when he's no longer in this class. But if French society is always going to view him as an immigrant, um, then what is he supposed to do? Um, so I think that the argument um, that other groups have successfully integrated, if the, if the points of success in that are white European Jews um, or Italian and Portuguese and Spanish immigrants after um, World War II, who just more physically resemble the majority French population. Um, I'm not sure that that is a model that is either realistic to the challenges that France faces today, um, or at least is one that the students themselves don't see as realistic. So I think um, similarly to how Eve talked about how there's the need for more exchange between teachers and students in the classroom, I think that there just needs to be a more sh kind of explicit discussion about what both sides of this divide think immigration should look like and some type of compromise. Thank you. You actually answered my second question, which was about race. So. <laughs> Beat you to it. <laughs> so why did you choose to conduct your research in France? Um, I. I wanted to study abroad in France because I had taken a lot of French literature classes here and kind of for totally disconnected reasons. Um, and then once I had made that decision, I thought it was important for me to think about how to maintain um, the interests and engagements I have here, um, particularly working with English language learners um, and thinking critically about the way that our education system functions for them um, while abroad and not uh, kind of ignore those aspects of a new society I was going to be in. Um, so that was kind of the impetus for um, getting involved with the community association that I talked about through tutoring um, and then speaking with people there um, and, and hearing some of the students' complaints about their educational system made me more interested in looking at it from an academic point of view. I have a, another question, a methodological question, just about, um, I was interested in what you said about his, how he took you down, I think you said eight pegs. Um, I'm wondering, um, so one of the things, I, so I'm a historian, as you know, and one of the things I've really struggled with is oral interviewing, where I found my, I, I found it very challenging, and I read a lot of the methodology on it, but never really felt like I hit my stride with figuring out how to get people to answer exactly the question I was asking. Um, so I was curious just a little bit about how your own thinking evolved around the methodology of um, ethnographic observation, conversation, uh, in order to get where you wanted to go? Mm -hmm. um, I think an important part of my methodology and a part that facilitated those types of conversations um, was that I was also working as a tutor um, and like after school programming volunteer at this community association. Um, so getting to hang out um, and interact with either bas through basic French tutoring or basic English tutoring um, or just playing soccer um, through this this organization um, on a like twice a week basis, kind of for two months before I started trying to do interviews, <coughs> which I think was really useful in allowing me to prove myself as an ally to these students um, and to their families as someone who was going to take what they had to say seriously. Um, and as someone who wasn't going to, to judge them for not conjugating a verb correctly, because probably half the time I wasn't conjugating the verbs correctly either. Um, so I think that relationship building before entering into interviews um, didn't make all the interviews go totally smoothly, but at least gave me and the interviewees a foundation where um, if it was heading in a direction that I was confused by, or similarly, if I asked them a question that they didn't think was relevant, um, at least gave us a, a foundation on which to discuss the interview and what we were both hoping to get out of it together as opposed to kind of a, a stranger dynamic. 
Thank you, Katya. Thanks. So our next presenter will be Bruna Lee. <laughs> Bruna Lee is a comparative literature and education studies double major. Her capstone project in education studies has allowed her to explore her interest in culturally relevant teaching, problem posing methodology, and critical conscious pedagogy through the lens of curriculum development. This project has allowed her to strengthen her relationship with Breakthrough Providence, a local nonprofit organization that successfully um, couples education theory and praxis. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking about my experience teaching at Breakthrough Providence this summer and how this experience has allowed me to, or has allowed me to develop the organization's social justice curriculum, um, working very closely with Breakthrough's program directors as well as my Ed Studies faculty advisor, uh, Professor Andrea Flores. So this all started in the summer of 2016. Uh, I was a teacher at Breakthrough Providence, uh, which is an organization super close to here. They're actually at the Wheeler School. And they have a dual mission of creating a pathway to college for low-income, academically motivated middle school students in Providence, while also encouraging high school and college students to pursue careers in education. So I was an eighth grade English teacher. These are some of my students. And uh, my co-teacher, Chanel, and other co-teacher, Ethan, up there. And we had just had a water balloon fight at Olympics Day, so that was super fun. Um, and that summer, uh, with the help of my mentor teacher, my co-teacher and I planned lessons that incorporated our eighth grade social justice topic of gentrification. And we incorporated our lesson plans in such a way that um, we talked about, we had discussions around gentrification in Providence while also working on concrete ELA skills uh, to combat summer learning loss. Um, and our summer together culminated in a social justice project in which the students created a video project to educate others about gentrification. So Breakthrough's approach to education uh, really stems from their commitment to social justice education as evidenced in the statement. So I'm just going to go ahead and read it. At Breakthrough Providence, we believe that education is a vehicle through which students develop a critical consciousness which allows them to identify, understand, and challenge systems of inequality. The student-centered nature of our curriculum and our critical pedagogical approach empowers students not only as individuals, but as a community of learners. The careful alignment of our leadership blocks, advisory activities, and academic classes allows for a comprehensive and holistic approach, giving students space to interrogate their understandings of systems of power in a number of different contexts. Students work on integrated projects that are relevant not only to their own individual lives, but also to the lived experiences of their families and communities. And so seventh graders this summer worked on the topic of the school to prison pipeline and eighth graders talked about um, the issue of gentrification um, specific to Providence. And our goal was really to make these issues meaningful and relevant to students' lives. So we planned our lessons this summer using a problem posing methodology, which allows us to localize these issues uh, and really talk specifically about Providence and how specific areas of Providence have been seeing changes um, in their communities over time. In addition to our focus on social justice, we also incorporated ELA skills use, um, such as, you kind of see it on the far left corner, but using text evidence to support emphasis and analysis, talking about character, theme, and setting. And so these are all kind of more academic skills that uh, we were really trying to work on um, as part of the summer learning loss piece there. Um, however, this all sounds really great in theory, uh, kind of integrating these, uh, this uh, social justice component, these academic skills into one cohesive lesson plan. But my co-teacher and I had a lot of challenges doing this, uh, one of which was really having not having enough time to find resources around the issue of gentrification that was really accessible to middle school students. Um, there was also a lot of, uh, there was a lack of communication between us as English teachers and our math teachers, which really became an issue later on when we had to create our social justice project together. And there was, uh, we also often felt like our classes were half, like half of them were focused on social justice and the other half was focused on the more academic skills and so um, we, had a really challenging time connecting the social justice piece to our traditionally academic lessons. So 
I was thinking about all this when I was thinking about my capstone project. And so I wanted to address some of these challenges that I faced as a teacher this summer to kind of make the teaching experience a little easier for future teachers so that they can feel better equipped with blending social justice and these more traditional academic skills into their lesson plans. And so the idea to expand the social justice resource packet um, and encouraging more connections between English and math classes through the curriculum really was an idea that I had, but also um, with through my experiences uh, working at Breakthrough, but also I worked really closely, again, with the program directors at Breakthrough. And so these are some of the, this is a Breakthrough team, um, that they're just like adults that are on a, just doing a little skit for us during teacher training. Um, so I worked really closely with Nick and Marisa, and I met um, who are program directors at Breakthrough. And we met every other week uh, throughout the spring semester um, to check in on my progress and kind of get consistent feedback on the resources that I was compiling. I also met with Professor Flores, my um, ed studies professor, to get feedback and advice on finding age appropriate resources. And I thought it was really important for me to continue building this curriculum in conjunction with the organization so that I could continually think about um, how our teachers and our students would work with this material and how they would react to it. So I eventually came up with a really long Google Doc, but I'm just going to show you the first page here. Um, so these are the instructions at the beginning of the document. Um, and I think that look, just looking through this, you can kind of see uh, my attempt at connecting uh, the, our English texts um, and also connecting um, the resources across uh, academic content, so both across English and math. and. I was doing all of this while also keeping in mind that problem posing methodology that I was talking about in which we kind of make the issues really relevant to Providence. So this is just a little snippet of the guide, uh, which is a much longer 23 page document. But um, so in the first resource, you can see that I have a much wider scope. And so um, it's just a podcast talking about gentrification. And so I thought that this material could really be used as kind of a in the first week as an introduction to the problem of gentrification. Um, here on the third column, you can see uh, a text resource, which is just a quote from one of the eighth grade texts this summer. And so I just incorporated the quote on there because I it reminded me of what the podcast was talking about. Um, the second resource is specific to Providence. So it's an article um, talking about the rent prices going up in Rhode Island and how 51% 51% of Rhode Islanders spend more than 30% of their income on housing, meaning their housing cost burdened. And um, I thought that this resource specifically would go really well both in the English and math classes because math teachers could use the numbers that they talk about in the article and the English teachers could use the article as a way to relate it to our eighth grade text. Um, and. At the end of this, I also gathered a final round of feedback by asking past and current teachers on the accessibility of this content and making sure that, um, and I made sure to ask them how they might use this document to plan their lessons this summer. So um, I was kind of trying really hard to continually working with the teachers to um, see how they will use this this summer. Um, so I think as a closing, my, this project really allowed me to reflect on my experiences as a teacher and to use these experiences to inform this process of uh, developing curriculum. We'll now open the floor up for questions. First of all, thank you so much for this presentation. I like it highlights some of the difficulties of being a teacher, and I appreciate presentations about that. Um, I'm curious <laughs> about like the little snippet that you showed us. Um, first of all, it looks really cool and very useful. Um, but it was, the first one was like a BuzzFeed article, um, and I was wondering like how you came about finding like relevant, um, I guess, material text that you put in this document that you produced and. Uh, what you had in mind? Did you, like students ever suggest anything for you? Or I don't know. What, what was your process? 
Yeah, so I tried um, my hardest to kind of get as many multimedia resources as possible. Uh, research has shown that that's specifically uh, useful for English language learners to not only, you know, have like the traditional text, but really using videos and podcasts mm -hmm. and plays and whatever. And so I kind of tried my hardest to, I started really with the kind of local news articles. And so there's a lot of, you know, like the Projo and articles, or um, there are some articles by, by the BDH in my resource packet. And then I also spent a lot of time on YouTube and on Google, honestly, just like looking up like podcasts and poems um, that like even remotely talked about these issues. Um, I had a really hard time finding stuff. I had a really time, hard time finding uh, age appropriate resources around housing because I found that so much of it was really kind of getting bogged down to like the legislative piece that I didn't find super kind of helpful or relevant. So you talked about this sort of disconnect between the English and the math curricula and how that made it more difficult to incorporate the social justice aspect. Um, were teachers who like were English teachers and math teachers ever sitting on in on each other's classes? Was was there sort of like an observation aspect that could maybe help that relationship with that? Yeah, so we had a social justice planning block that was every Monday and that was a chance for English and math teachers to kind of get together and chat, but somehow that always kind of slipped by and it was just only 20 minutes and we didn't really get to chat much. Unfortunately, while our math teachers were teaching, um, that was usually our planning block, and so it was really tough for us to kind of sit in, but we did sit in a couple of times and it was um, particularly around thinking of, well, like I have a really hard time connecting to like this one specific student, like how do other teachers do it? Um, I also, would like to note that there is a Breakthrough Providence teacher in the audience, so if they would like to add anything, I'm not gonna point them out. <laughs> but feel free. <laughs> yes? How did you constructively define what age-appropriate means when doing this work, especially considering like in the context of English, there's people at different reading and writing levels um, entering the space, so to make it both challenging and engaging for students, but also not too challenging to the point where it's disillusioning. Yeah, um, so that was definitely one of the biggest challenges of this project. I definitely would used a lot of my personal experiences as a, t as a teacher and seeing kind of what worked and what didn't. So I remember very specifically that there was like one article by the BDH that we used in class this past summer that students were like so bored by and didn't really know what to make of it. And so I, kind of just looked at the language around those specific articles that students didn't really find helpful. Um, and, but there are also some resources in the, pa in the resource guide that I say like, well, this would have to be adapted, like the content's really good, but maybe you as a teacher can, you know, like only select certain passages. Uh, in terms of, there are a lot of like kind of really big picture like ACLU reports and those are really tough because they're like 50 pages. And so I kind of went in and picked out specific graphics for um, the math teachers and the English teachers to work on. Yeah. And going along with that question, were there ever <coughs> lessons that you wanted to separate uh, academia from the social justice component? Because academia can be alienating in that way, like in forms of language, and kind of uh, to criticize academia in any way? Um, or was that, was that a consideration, I guess, to want to separate them? and to show the problems of having that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I tried my hardest to not make this super, like traditionally academic in the way that like we might see in some of our classes here at Brown. Like, um, so there, like, there were definitely, you know, like I ran into some dissertations or like some longer papers that talked about gentrification in Providence, for example. And I purposely didn't include those um, and preferred rather to incorporate kind of other sources of media that also are valuable and that students might not really see in their classrooms. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Um, I am the other breakthrough teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just want to thank you on behalf of future teachers, because I think for us, um, like a big barrier to success within the classroom was just time, that yeah. we would go from the like 7.30 a.m. in the morning 
we would have a teaching block, then we'd plan, then we'd have lunch where we'd be with the students, then like more planning, and we'd maybe get home by 7 p.m., like make dinner, then have to lesson plan for the rest of the day. So there just wasn't enough time to find all these resources and to really create really effective lessons. So it's great that you've done that work for them. Thank you. <laughs> With that, we'll move to our next presenter, Anne. Anne Fosberg is a first semester senior concentrating in an IC in critical pedagogy. She's originally from Park City, Utah, and began studying um, critical pedagogy after taking a series of independent study courses in experimental education models. She hopes to teach in some capacity after graduating from Brown, but does not know yet in what context it will be. Uh, thank you. Um, so my thesis is in an independent concentration in critical pedagogy, which Bruno talked a little bit about. Um, it's an educational philosophy that holds that education is inherently political um, and can either reproduce or dismantle dominant narratives and structures of power. Um, working on finishing my first chapter of my thesis, which is a narrative history of higher education done two ways. Um, I have a standard academic history, uh, followed by a dialogue between scholars of critical pedagogy that tells the story of how institutions of higher education have been identified as mechanisms of state control and reimagined as sites of resistance. So, in beginning this project, I was interested in making explicit the ways in which knowledge is always produced in community and the ways that the fallacy of individual knowledge production um, contributes to oppressive norms of a capitalist economic system. Uh, in keeping, I structured this project in dialogues. I conducted conversations with about a dozen scholars of critical pedagogy whose work connects to higher education. I was interested in thinking about the potential for universities uh, that had originally had the purpose of reproducing social and economic inequality and to be reclaimed as spaces of political resistance and community building. After transcribing these conversations, I rearranged them into a continuous narrative of resistance, which wove together disparate voices and my own analysis. Uh, the way we tell stories matters, and framing resistance as a continuity allows us to locate and learn from dissent throughout time. Um, I focused on three primary projects of educational reimagining that began in the 60s to set the groundwork for the historical narrative up to the present day. Uh, the ethnic studies movement in San Francisco, the free schools and experimental colleges, and the Weather Underground Organization in Ann Arbor. These movements, while particular to a certain time and place, allow us to begin to think about how universities and institutions of higher education um, can be both recognized as instruments of state control that have historically reproduced wealth and social inequality, um, and at the same time, potential sites of radical organizing. These are the movements that were most often referenced as foundational in the dialogues that I used as source material. Um, so I used them to sort of construct an understanding of our current system of higher education. Um, ethnic studies was a movement that sought to remake both content and pedagogy of educational communities to remedy uh, the misrepresentation and lack of representation of marginalized people in the curriculum of the university. Uh, free schools and experimental colleges rejected the structures of institutions as they existed and built new ones, working in the aim of modifying the context of the academy. Uh, the Weather Underground rejected the institution full stop, um, but used its resources and community to build a movement that focused its energies elsewhere namely the overthrow of the US government, which was obviously unsuccessful. Uh, so I want to take a little bit of time to demonstrate what I mean by building dialogues between scholars. Uh, this is an excerpt of my chapter that is dealing with the paradoxes of advocating for a radical political agenda within an, a conservative or repressive institution. Uh, it's a conversation between Ira Shore, who's a critical pedagogue teaching at CUNY, Antonia Darter, who's a professor of education and critical studies at Loyola Marymount University, and Jeff Duncan Andrade, who's a professor of ethnic studies in San Francisco State. Um, Ira Shore starts, he says that education, or higher education, is an institutional leviathan. It's enormous, state-regulated, state-funded, and so it's a function of the status quo. It's set up to meet the needs of the status quo and to keep things in place. Universities were not established in conflict with the political system. They were established by the political system to get things done. And Antonia Darter responds, um, 
I don't think you can go anywhere and not hit against contradictions. You can't even do it in people's personal lives, let alone the lives of institutions. It's first and foremost recognizing that these contradictions are going to be there, and they are, to a certain extent, fundamental. Uh, depending on the cultural and ethical values that inform the institution, the contradictions are going to be greater or less. A lot has to do with one's capacity to read power, to think about the ethics under which we're working, studying, and living, um, and what the ethics that we want to live under might look like. One of the greatest problems we're dealing with is that these universities were set up for the elite, and they perpetuate a particular project of dominance. But then, of course, there's this other democratic rhetoric that moves through these spaces. You've got a tension between the dominant values of these institutions and the progressive values that have been growing up at the same time. There's a whole societal push to bring more people in. Hegemony has the power to accommodate and adjust to the pressures that are being put on it by absorbing the pieces that allow it to perpetuate itself and then discarding that which would require deep structural change. Um, and Jeff Duncan Andrade finishes with, um, public schools in this nation were founded as a colonial project. And so we're making adjustments to curriculum or pedagogy, but not actually interrogating the foundation. Public schools for what? Why do we send kids to public schools for 13 years? And if the answer to that question isn't to create wellness and justice, then everything you do going forward is going to be corruptible. I don't think there's any serious conversation in the nation right now about why we have public schools in the first place. Um, we keep measuring all these things that are really a measure of compliance with the historical imperative of the colonial project, which is to create institutional rationalization for inequality. I think the purpose of schools should be truth-telling. So these three scholars all speak to the ways in which institutions of higher education can function as mechanisms of control, while at the same time providing spaces for a resistant community to be built. Although they weren't speaking directly to each other, part of my project is recognizing the ways that their thought and work has drawn from each other's, and explicitly acknowledging the lineages of my own knowledge and scholarship. The way we tell stories matters, and the voices we choose to include in those stories has political impact. My thesis is thinking about how to mirror form and content, how to build a structure that is as intentional as the pieces that make it up. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll now open the floor up for questions. Yeah. Um, are you able, I don't so much, but are you able to include people who are outside of the university setting in the dialogue? Yeah, so I've been talking with uh, everybody who will sit down with me. Um, there are conversations with students. Um, with people outside of the academy and within the academy, and also people who engage in educational pro like projects that wouldn't necessarily qualify as like academic exactly, um, like overlapping projects of education and social justice. Yes. Um, could you talk at all about how everything you're just talking about um, relates to some of the research you've done on Brown specifically and some of your findings on the open curriculum? Sure. So um, that's the chapter I definitely haven't written yet. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm thinking a lot about how um, historically Brown um, the development of the open curriculum was essentially um, an instance of student activism in the 60s as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of situating that moment um, alongside all of these other sort of activist projects of the 60s. And um, the students who were advocating for the open curriculum wanted a kind of pedagogical coherence across the university. So they were looking for a different approach to teaching and learning. Um, and I'm trying to look at how, um, how we've kept sort of the structures that they advocated for without necessarily incorporating the philosophy. So I think that um, we have things like um, like taking classes SNC and no distribution requirements, um, but there was never any large scale incorporation of the kind of pedagogical coherence that they wanted. Structurally, mm -hmm. so you have the 60s Mm -hmm. Foundation, you have the chapter that you spoke about, and you have the Brown chapter. Are those the three? Are there more? Are there other? 
Um, then the first chapter is sort of an overview of, of critical pedagogy. Um, and, uh, thinking about the, the history of it as a discipline and some of the critiques of how it's been uh, very white and very male. Um, mm -hmm. It will be the first chapter. So I have a question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Go ahead. Uh, so, mm -hmm. I, I'm just wondering if this research has made you feel more or less hopeful in general about these kinds of critique and like experiment, experiments happening within formal institutions? Um, I think it's changed the way I think about what a successful project within the academy looks like. So I don't, I think that um, like these radical projects within the university are great practice, um, but you're never going to change the structures of the university. And I think you see that over and over again, that um, any desire or like any push to force the university to be something other than what it is largely doesn't work. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't have communities within this institution that have a certain set of politics or a certain set of aims. Um, those two things are not necessarily in conflict with one another. My question was, can you see these experimental models being implemented out um, in possibly like the high school level and how it would probably develop more students to be, um, you know, more socially aware? Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons I decided to stick with higher education mm -hmm. is that um, we see critical pedagogy as a project being taken up in K through 12 education mm -hmm. quite a bit, actually. So there are a lot of these sort of uh, educational experiments happening um, on the high school level. And you can see it um, I don't know, in a whole, whole bunch of different contexts, probably not on it's not being implemented like full stop in the public high schools. But um, I was interested in thinking about higher education because I think we almost, there's a lot less scholarship around pedagogy in the university than there is around pedagogy in K through 12 education. Thanks. Okay. All right, our next presenter. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Yuval Yousefi. Yuval hails from the Big Island, Long Island, New York, and is extremely excited to be participating in Theories in Action this year. At Brown, he concentrates in history of economic theory, an independent concentration that studies mathematical economic theories within their historical, social, and cultural context. Following graduation, Yuval will begin a two-year fellowship with the Venture for America, which connects recent graduates to opportunities in cities with emerging entrepreneurial um, ecosystems. Thank you so much. You. So again, yeah, my name is Yuval. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on myself before I jump into the project, uh, I am concentrating in a concentration that I've designed for myself called the History of Economic Theory, which basically looks at how we study economics, both uh, mainstream economics and how that's evolved, but then also looking at critical theories that try to kind of poke holes um, and look at what can be changed and what might be uh, worth revising within the mainstream. My project uh, specifically focuses on feminist economics, um, which is a critical theory, and specifically at the cohort of feminist e economists that uh, did most of their work in the 80s and 90s. Um, they critiqued economics for uh, adhering to a, a view of objectivity that was overly masculine, that separated economics far too far from the empirical, empirical reality of like real economic life. Um, so that's, that's what my project is on. Today, uh, I'm not going to get too bogged down into their specific arguments. They can be a little bit technical. Um, so I'm going to just cover them briefly and then hope to uh, explain really their implications for what we might see in a, in a kind of idealized or a changed uh, academic discipline, how, how, those, um, how those could follow through. So uh, we can begin by looking at neoclassical mainstream economic theory today. 
Um, and note that it's a fairly narrow focus um, that they choose to take in studying economic life. And I actually like to start actually with economic methods and how they, uh, what feminist economists like to argue about um, when looking at that, because uh, the methods that economists tend to use are those that uh, you know uh, operate in terms of kind of a physics envy, kind of a, a desire to scientific to make economics more scientific, um, which ha itself, in and of itself, that argument is rooted in masculine causes, um, ideas of reasoning as uh, you know m logical and uh, you know scientific separation and detachment. Uh, ensuring that we are kind of value free when analyzing a situation. In that, economics uh, shifted and continues to shift more and more towards solely using mathematics, mathematical modeling, and statistics to study economic life. Now, these methods are deeply important and they're very useful in a lot of contexts, but when you uh, narrow your focus to only include these methods, um, it can be dangerous. And specifically, in narrowing uh, and only using these methods, the economists have excluded a whole set of more qualitative methods, oftentimes associated with femininity in our, uh, in our society. Uh, methods like historical analysis, ethnography, interviewing and surveying uh, subjects, and also you know participant observation, um, methods that are extremely important to the study of any uh, of any area, especially that of a social science and of economic life. Um, one specific point to be said there is that. Uh, mathematics and statistics, again, going back to the, the attempt to be value free, um, because it's a very logical and abstracted language, mathematics itself, it gives the appearance of being value free and neutrality. However, if you scratch the surface, which we will in a moment, uh, you can see that these uh, notions of value free, um, they are not true. And in reintroducing qualitative methods into the conversation can help us be very much more intentional about the values we're using um, and kind of our starting assumptions. So this use of mathematics and statistics, of course, has implications in economic theory. And when in the 1870s, economics started to shift over towards mathematics, uh, they also uh, began to change the content of their view, specifically only looking at uh, markets, economic markets, pricing, money, all of the things that tend to lend themselves very easily to mathematics, the language of numbers. Um, in this, though, we lose a lot of the distinctions between uh, human needs and human wants and how that changes how we operate in economic life. Um, the way that when we go and purchase a good that we need, uh, the thinking and our behaviors that go into that kind of decision are going to be different from when we are going to purchase something that we want. Um, and that has a very important implications for how we in our own economic life also interact with the natural world and its resources that we use uh, continuously. And that again, that shift again uh, shows kind of a shift uh, towards uh, masculine bias and, uh, or masculine uh, conceptions of economic life, um, going away kind of from uh, connection with society, connection with nature, which are traditionally associated again with femininity, um, and moving towards a more masculine, ordered, uh, you know, very clearly exchange, everything can be easily exchanged on the market. These are all kind of more masculine uh, approaches to economics. So given these critiques, we can look at what a new economics could look like ideally. Um, and in such, a, such uh, an, an idea, we would want to look at uh, restructuring of disciplines, not by method, which is what has very much happened in economics, as they focus on mathematics, but on subject matter, restructuring disciplines by subject matter. And that would give uh, you know, economic study an ability uh, to really include a variety of methods and a variety of viewpoints that creates a much more holistic study. So you can imagine a study of economics where some academics uh, you know, specialize in their own singular fields will still have uh, financial economists and mathematical economists, but they can then be in conversations with conver uh, academics who specialize in other fields like historical, uh, historical economics, um, ones that use kind of a more direct and on the ground approach to studying uh, you know, how people move within economic life. Um, and within this conversation, again, we can be much more intentional about the assumptions we're making in economics and become much more, uh, create a much more interdisciplinary study of economics. Again, that would be the ideal. 
I think it's also really important to mention that while my specific focus, my specific study um, is within economics, and that's my personal uh, you know, expertise, um, this uh, argument can be applied to disciplines throughout the academy. And in fact, it actually came out of uh, arguments that began in philosophy, but then also uh, moved through the sciences themselves, critiques that had applied to biology, physics, uh, ecology, and then from there were picked up and brought into economics. Um, a really good parallel, a really good example of such an, of, uh, you know, this type of uh, work done in the sciences, for example, since that's a little bit tougher for some people to kind of wrap their heads around from the beginning. I was imagining kind of health sciences and looking at, you know, you're uh, trying to understand a certain set of patient symptoms and their experiences with a certain set of diseases. You can connect interviews with the patients uh, that really give you insight into their experience with the disease, what they're feeling, how they're feeling, um, when the symptoms arise and when they don't and stuff like that, conducting these interviews, maybe even observing them in their day to day as they go through uh, living with this disease, and then connecting that back with a mathematical analysis. You have a set of data and understanding, okay, what did we learn from this ethnography that we did with these patients, and how can we apply that to decide which value variables are most important um, in studying the disease from a more uh, you know, uh, explicitly logical point of view. So I think that this actually has, has a really interesting implication for uh, academia across the board. Um, and, uh, and at that point, I think uh, that's what I would like to leave you with. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So before we circle back to the framing um, question, I wanted to open the floor up for any questions for Yuval. I just want to uh, say specifically before the framing question you called that was fabulous. Thank you so much. I felt like I learned something. And it was really cool for me to hear your presentation juxtaposed with Anne's. And yeah. as fa in fact, uh, as an educator, I found all of your presentations super inspiring. And um, I really enjoyed hearing all of what you had to say and I, individual presentations, but all together, um, I just learned something more. Um, question for you, Yuval, specifically. Have you gotten, I, I see what you're doing, and I, um, my, I guess I have two questions. A, when you say feminist theory or feminist econ um, economic theory, is that your framing, or are you or are you taking that from other scholars? So that's my first question. And then whether or not it's yours or other scholars, have you gotten any pushback on that? Yeah. Um, because it's kind of a binary, right? Definitely. Of, yeah. So. I so I can definitely address this. So first of all. Uh, my project in, in and of itself is a type of historical analysis, and it's looking specifically at uh, feminist economists who uh, kind of defined themselves <coughs> that in this, in this specific moment had actually uh, began to organize. They created their own academic journal. They created their own academic um, organization. So they very much defined themselves in that moment. Um, but these are economists working in the 80s and 90s um, and have since definitely experienced a lot of uh, deconstructivist feedback or, or critique, um, kind of looking at their use of binaries and dichotomies and understanding gender. Um, and I definitely think that those critiques are well worth uh, attention. That said, I think that a lot of the implications that come from their work are still um, worth listening to, um, looking at the ideas of um, you know, how we can create a more inclusive academia um, that seeks to really understand each of the, you know, the positions that we come to and the biases that we come to when conducting research. Um, and specifically, I'm sure I, I wouldn't be surprised if other people have come across this as well, but they, they really champion standpoint theory of you know, recognizing your own place uh, upon approaching a research uh, research project, recognizing your own biases, um, and then engaging with them with your work. But yes, they have definitely um, encountered that criticism. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not deeply familiar with their current um, or with the range of current uh, theories that come out of feminist economics to so see how they responded.
So what motivated you to um, conduct this research? Yeah. Um, so I, I actually kind of fell into this mm -hmm. uh, kind of accidentally. I'd taken a class last year that looked at uh, growth theories from a lot of different perspectives. And one of those perspectives was um, the work of uh, Marilyn Waring, who's a very famous feminist economist who published um, a, a seminal book in the late 80s about um, United Nations accounting and, and women's unpaid work. Um, and I loved it. I reread a chapter and I just picked up the book and read the rest. Um, ended up doing my, my final paper in that course on that subject. And then when I came to realize that I needed to do some kind of culminating project for my senior year, um, I decided that I wanted to keep pursuing this. Um, this specific project came out of a lot of different iterations of pre previous ones. Um, it began, I, I, I wanted to really understand how they formed the organization, what those connections between the economists, how they met, what the conversations were they were having in those in those years, the, the late 80s and early 90s. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of that data was hard to come by. So instead, I decided to move into a type of intellectual history, understanding where their arguments came from within the academy, and then kind of situating themselves and how they manifested um, in, fam in economics specifically. Um, given your framing question and what you all presented on, I'd be curious to actually turn this question back on you. Um, not only vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your positionality in doing the projects or theses that you did, um, so you know, working at Breakthrough with communities of color, in, uh, American in migrant rural China, you know. Um, but also to think about what Brown is trying to do regarding diversity and inclusion. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Uh, all of us, or? Anywhere, oh, okay. anyone. <laughs> oh, I, can, I can pick it up. Um, feminist economics, ec economics for me was a very, um, you know, it was very, it was a project that was very uh, distant from me when I first encountered it, especially as a, a white man who grew up a very privileged life. This was not something, these were not arguments that I necessarily came into contact with until really last year. Um, so I think that was a really important question that I've kind of grappled through both implicitly and explicitly at different points in my project, kind of figuring out how I wanted to study this given my extreme separation from uh, from a lot, of, or apparent separation, at least in the beginning. Um, I think the way that I kind of grappled with it and really figured out how, how I felt best about it was really just to keep an open mind, um, consistently read everything I could, uh, argue these concepts with people around me, both ones that are you know, well-versed in the topics and not, um, and just you know, uh, make sure not to be, while being critical is extremely important when judging academic work, um, not to be critical from a standpoint that is closed-minded from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I can speak a little to this. I think that um, my thesis as a project, this is sort of the central question. Um, one of the, the core tenets of critical pedagogy is to problematize the context in which you find yourself. So I kind of stay in your lane. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so, in line with that, I've been thinking a lot about Brown. I've been thinking a lot about elite institutions of higher education. And um, critical pedagogy asks us to interrogate where, where we see power um, in the communities in which we find ourselves and whether that allocation and distribution is just and how we can work together to interrogate those structures and redistribute power so that it is, it is a more uh, just and fair distribution. So that feels pretty central to the project that I'm thinking about. I think just having done a lot of work in Providence overall, like not only a breakthrough Providence, but also working in Oneyville with adult immigrant communities has really made me think a lot of, like you said, like my position as a Brown student and also really taking those educational experiences as a way to learn more about how others might see me and how like I might learn from others and so you know especially I think this really was evident in my work at Breakthrough when I was um, there were a couple of brown students there and like some of the teams uh, some of the people 
you know, the, some of the administrators and the program directors are Brown alum, but we really kind of valued um, the voices of students who are native to Providence, who like have lived in Providence their whole lives. And um, we had students that go to classical, go to Wheeler, um, students at URI, students at Rick. And so really kind of getting to expand my brown Providence bubble outwards and meeting folks who are members of other institutions within Providence. Um, I think one thing I think about in terms of power, both for my project and just generally in terms of like teaching middle schoolers, um, is what is understood as like acceptable exertions of power versus unacceptable um, and how like discipline often is, is determined upon those lines. Um, and I think, right, in schools where we see power concentrated in administrators um, and in the curriculum and not in students, um, when you have a group of, of middle schoolers who are maybe being deemed bad, I think it's worth questioning whether those students are just exercising the only power that they find themselves having in their school setting. Um, so I think a classroom in which middle schoolers are being disruptive is a, is a classroom in which these middle schoolers are feeling like the only power that they have is the power to be disruptive. They can't control what's happening else in the, what else is happening in the classroom. So what they can control is whether that happens easily or not. Um, so I think that something I think about and I'm imagining going forward is how to use those opportunities as um, chances to reimagine how students can find other avenues of power in the classroom um, so that we're not funneling students into situations um, in which the only chance to exert power that they have is one that's deemed unacceptable. Yeah, um, I think uh, my own research definitely uh, found similar kind of things um, in terms of power um, and space allocated for students within the institution in the same way that Katya's did. Um, I think, I, I already mentioned this a little bit, but I think also um, these institutions have a huge amount of power, particularly schools and stuff, and how they um, structure information and access to information mm -hmm. for families, especially when they're immigrant families and maybe they don't speak um, the, the language of the area as well, or maybe they, don't, they aren't literate in that language and other things like that. Um, and in those cases, like, students really become the way that, like, these people with access to knowledge and therefore power um, share that knowledge with people who don't have as much access. Um, and that also becomes a way for these institutions to control the opportunities that people and groups may have. Um, and then to speak a little bit, um, and I don't know if I guess, Katya, you're the only other person who did like international research, and I don't know if um, this is similar for Katya's um, experience, but I found that as an American in China, it, it's actually like kind of difficult to bring critiques of the institution to the institution itself mm -hmm. um, when you're an outsider and you're trying to gather research. Um, and especially with China, because the US generally, like media representations of China are not generally very favorable. And Chinese people generally kind of know that and they see that. And so when you go as an American to a school like this, there's already the presumption that you come with, cr with criticisms and with kind of prejudices against these institutions and the way they interact with people. Um, and for me, part of my research, or like part of like integrating into the community that I found myself in was to like actively reject those um, ideas about Chinese people and Chinese society. Um, but then coming back to Brown, I kind of had to like reabsorb those ideas in order to create like a, a thesis based around Western theories developed like within Western institutions. And that's definitely problematic. Um, and I think just something that, that people who do international research um, kind of need to think about more within the process of gathering research and in interpreting the data that we gather and presenting it to both people who, are, who share our backgrounds and also people who come from different um, experiences and contexts. I think maybe Eve just kicked it off by yeah. drawing a connection between our two projects, but um, one thing that we were thinking about a lot as we planned this panel um, was how our information, like our findings, instead of being viewed as silo, like are really actually interconnected and hopefully are interconnected with some of the things that you all thought of when you 
we're given this prompt. Um, so I think maybe one thing we want to like leave you with or make sure we hit before we, we end are some of the connections that we saw between our own projects. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll start off, and I kind of mentioned this already, but I think I, the big connection I see between all of us is that we're like talking about these relationships between institutions and people or groups, um, whether they're educational institutions, um, you know, primary school, secondary school, or colleges, or whether they're um, kind of disciplines and like uh, schools of thought and narratives um, contextualized in spaces. But they definitely, all of these institutions structure like the way individuals and groups understand each other and understand the wider world. And they also mediate the way these groups present themselves and are represented to the world. Um, and in particular, educational institutions, like in my research and in Katya's, Bruna's, and um, Anne's, all of those have a lot of power in choosing how to represent the marginalized or whether they represent them at all. Um, and the space that marginalized, ha marginalized people have to kind of um, express their wants and their needs. Um, and I think something that we've seen a lot is that a lot of these institutions structure the way they address the needs of marginalized people around the convenience and the wants of the institution itself. And that's something that you know I think um, all of our research is trying to uh, reject and speak against. Yeah, I think um, in addition to that, and um, talked about how education is inherently political. Um, and I think that both Eve and my work bears that out um, in showing kind of kind of the flip side of the critical pedagogy or like the risk at the other extreme um, of schools really being institutions with the potential to reinforce and thus perpetuate societal exclusion. Um, and then on a, I guess, more hopeful level, <laughs> I see a connection between my work and Bruna's um, in terms of thinking about how educational systems in general, but curriculum in specific, um, can be made more relevant to the realities of students' lives um, and the big impact that that can have. Yeah. I think just to add to that, I definitely saw a lot of connections with Anne and Yuval's projects in terms of um, having knowledge be produced or reproduced through community efforts and kind of like rethinking the way that we speak about some of the facts. Yeah, I, I also I see a lot of connections between the work that Bruna's doing and the work that I do. Um, I think that Bruna's project is, is sort of an example of what the theoretical work I do looks like on the ground, which is very cool. Um, and I also see a lot of connections with um, what Yuval is thinking about in terms of the, the political implications of certain discourses or academic languages and who they include and who they exclude, um, who's privy to speaking them. Yeah, and, and just to build on what's already been said, definitely, uh, I think the strongest connection, at least between my project, or one of the stronger ones is, is with Anne's project. Um, again, looking at those, you know, university as a political body um, and, and the interplay between those in and out. Um, I also think that there's a really interesting connection between my project and uh, Katya's project, only because, you know, it's interesting to look at even once, uh, you know, a marginalized a uh, person or group finds their voice, can actually express it, and, and gets the, the moment to actually be able to do so, um, there's so much more work in taking the next step and implementing that, that voice into real, um, real action and change. And, and in the case of feminist economics, at least, we have not, been, we have not gotten there yet. I guess we can open it up to any other questions or, or discussion from the audience, uh, if there are any others. Thank you. I guess we'll conclude at this time. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>